This webcast and any accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. Copyright 2015, all rights reserved. My name is Shauna Strickland. I am a respiratory therapist, asthma educator, and associate executive director of education at the American Association for Respiratory Care. Today's presentation is palliative care, more than morphine. Upon completion of this AARC webcast, participants will be able to define palliative care and differentiate this from hospice, discuss evidence regarding the timing for initiation of palliative care, identify the necessary physical, emotional, and spiritual assessments associated with palliative care, and discuss how the respiratory therapist can positively impact the patient's symptom control. I am pleased to welcome Ms. Helen Sorensen. Helen is a respiratory therapist and adjunct faculty at UT Health Science Center, Department of Respiratory Care in San Antonio, Texas. She is the AARC Palliative Care Roundtable Chair and was the 2014 AARC section, Education Section Specialty Practitioner of the Year. I disclose that I am a, a paid employee of the American Association for Respiratory Care, and Helen declares no conflict of interest. Helen, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Shauna, for asking me. Thank you for being patient, and I do believe that I need a little bit of palliative care myself right now. Um, Palliative care has been something that I've been passionate about for, the, for many, many years, but having gone through some issues with my brother earlier this year and, under, and seeing firsthand what happens in the hospital made me even more passionate about this. Actually, palliative care is something we do on a regular basis, but we don't always recognize it as being palliative. We just, we just know we're trying to help our patients breathe easier, cough less or have less pain. We try to cheer them up. We try to bring a little respiratory sunshine to our patients, and that basically is what palliative care is. Um, it's just kind of in reviewing the objectives which you've seen, I think one of the biggest obstacles we need to overcome is the idea that palliative care and hospice are the same thing, because they're not. But the term hospice actually comes from the French word hospitium and was a place of shelter for traveling travelers um, maintained by monks. It's come to mean a home for the sick or the poor, and more recently, a home-like facility to provide supportive care for the terminally ill. The term has been expanded to services offered by agencies to care for terminally ill patients and to provide support for families. Hospice can take place in the hospital. You can have um, specific hospital facilities. You can have hospice at home. There's a lot of different places where, where it can be. The other thing is hospice is a wonderful service for both the patient and the family. And I think if I were to take a poll of the audience right now, I suspect that about 30 to 40 percent of you have had some firsthand experience. If you look at the definition of hospice, you'll see that the key word is terminally ill. Other implications in hospice is that the patient is dying. Um, in fact, to qualify for hospice, a physician has to sign a document stating that he or she would not be surprised if the patient died in the next six months. Hospice employs a multidisciplinary team. This is usually composed of a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, um, very often the chaplain, to see that all services are covered. And this coverage does vary by state and can be found in many venues. If you are working with a patient that is being transferred to hospice or hospice is recommended, it's probably a good idea to figure out what exactly is going on in your state so you know what's being covered. This is a traditional diagram used to distinguish hospice from palliative care. This is a diagram I've used many times, and there's nothing wrong with the diagram. If you start with a diagnosis of the disease at the bottom, you will see that there are equal amounts of curative and palliative care being given. And as the disease progresses, there is 
less curative care and more palliative care until you get to the last six months. And that's the time when, when curative care stops. The only problem I have with this diagram is that no symptoms are addressed and it doesn't clearly express the concept of palliation or symptom control. This is actually a slide that Shauna and, and um, Cheryl and I worked on when we were out in Las Vegas. And it's a little bit busier, but I think it clearly addresses the difference between palliative care and hospice, starting with the diagnosis of a terminal disease. And if you look inside the box that's outlined with a black, down at the bottom you'll see terminal disease diagnosis. This can be a diagnosis of cancer, emphysema, ALS, cystic fibrosis, end-stage liver disease, COPD, and many others. Attention at this time is focused on curative care and regular assessment. And you'll notice up at the top we have added regular assessment for pain, dyspnea, and other symptoms. Whatever is bothersome. Once the symptoms are identified, and then palliative care begins and then you move to the middle box, to the blue box in the middle. Where curative care continues, palliative care begins. Understanding that this is long before hospice is taking place. And in fact, curative, palliative care and curative care can last six months to years. The last six months when the physician is willing to sign that he would not be surprised if his patient died in the next six months is when curative care stops and palliative care continues. And I think this is where so much of the confusion comes because people are presuming that hospice and palliative care are the same thing. When in fact palliative care starts long before the patient is actually admitted into hospice. There are a lot of different definitions for palliative care, but I kind of like this one from the World Health Organization because it seems to be a little more inclusive. Um, it's an approach, and I like that term approach, that implies quality of life for those with a life-threatening illness. It provides pain, it provides re relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. This palliative care definition very much emphasizes that a team approach is needed to address the needs of patients. And the other thing is palliative care is applicable early in the course of the illness in conjunction with other different aggressive therapies. It's not started when little or no hope is left. This slide gives a comparison between the two of them. For palliative care, care for patients with a terminal illness is given regardless of the stage. So whether they are newly diagnosed or they have been diagnosed a year ago, once we have symptoms, then we start palliative care. Hospice is care during the last six months or when the physician orders hospice services. Under palliative care, symptom control is done by a variety of means. We do non-invasive ventilation, we do oxygen, we use a lot of chemo drugs, whatever, whatever, um, whatever the symptoms are at this point we're going to be controlling. In hospice, the symptoms the, there's non-aggressive symptom control. And this actually varies from hospice facility to hospice facility. Some of them will allow non-invasive ventilation, some of them won't. So if, you, if your loved one is going to hospice and you're, you want to know what type of symptom control they have, it's probably something you could ask them. As far as reimbursement, both palliative care and hospice are reimbursed by health insurance. In palliative care, the care can be provided at home, it can be provided in the hospital, it can be provided in the intensive care, in subacute care. It's what we've always done. It's trying to make sure that our patients are comfortable and that we're managing their symptoms. And then hospice care is provided by the hospice, but hospice also, also offers bereavement services to the families. This could mean anything from bereavement support groups to support letters, phone calls, grief therapists. Again, it depends on the hospice services you're using. 
And the other thing, the hospice bereavement services can extend for up to a year following the death of the hospice patient. And this is a really good service for the ones that are left behind. So what's the evidence for palliative care? I can remember many years ago when evidence-based medicine was introduced, there were a lot of skeptics wondering how this was going to work. Did lack of evidence mean we were doing something wrong? Kind of like these little birds here. I, when we talked about evidence-based medicine, I think we all felt like we were a little bit out on a limb because it was new. It was new. So what do we want with the evidence? Do we want randomized controlled trials? When I was on the AARC Clinical Practice Guideline Committee in 2001 to 2004, we worked on the very first evidence-based clinical practice guideline, which was care of the ventilator circuit. We read lots of research, and I do mean we read lots of research articles, but the ones we focused on were the randomized control trial studies. We were looking for well-designed, with an adequate number of control and intervention subjects, those were considered the best research. But what about evidence for palliative care? What are the ethical issues involved? And what are the issues regarding complementary medicine? We have a lot of anecdotal testimony about Reiki, about acupuncture, about herbal medicine. We have a lot of people that have left the country and gone someplace else to get care for whatever disease they have. And they've come back saying they've been cured. We may not have proof, but do we tell people that don't do this because it won't work? We don't know. We have started doing palliative care research, however. There's ethical issues of a placebo control. How do you tell somebody we're not going to treat you? You can't do that. Standardized treatment, measurement of subtle, subtle results, and the cost of clinical trials. And then there's a question between quantitative versus qualitative research. Do we want to look at numbers, or do we want to go for feelings? And the consensus, which was published in Palliative Medicine in 2003, was that those who argue for and against clinical trials and palliative care are neither right or wrong, but absence of trying would hinder progress. This is one of the first randomized controlled trials that was published. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, and they randomized 151 patients with newly diagnosed non-small cell lung cancer to early palliative care plus standard oncology care or standard oncology care alone. Basically, these 151 patients all got the best oncology care there was. It was just that some patients were randomized to early palliative care. Their primary outcome was quality of life at 12 weeks. And at the end of 12 weeks, they found patients in the early palliative care group had better quality of life, they had fewer depressive symptoms, they had less aggressive end-of-life care. But that what they didn't expect was when they looked over the long term was they had longer median survival, 11.6 versus 8.9 months. And it may not sound like a lot of time but if you have cancer, it is. This is another one that was done that was a single blind randomized trial. They looked at 105 adults with refractory breathlessness. This was done over in London between 2010 and 2012. They randomized 53 of these people to breathlessness support services and 52 to usual care. Now, the breathlessness support services were short-term services integrating palliative care, respiratory medicine, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. I don't know exactly what they were, but I'm guessing it was expanded on the pursed lip breathing and some other things. Their outcome was patient-reported breathlessness mastery. Of the 105 adults, 83 patients completed the assessment at week six. The survival rate from randomization to six months later was 94% of the adults 
in the randomization and the breathlessness support services were still alive, 75% in the control group. So when we look at stuff like this, we know that palliative care works. This was another study that was done specifically with patients with COPD. They looked at this, I think, was a retrospective chart review. They looked at those who received palliative care at those who hadn't. What they found was very few of the 91 patients that had palliative care, only 17 of the 91. Those that had palliative care had a longer hospital stay. They had a higher rate of do not resuscitate orders. Actually, 100% of them did not want DNR. They had a lower rate of ICU mortality. They ordered less CPR, and the cost was much less. And their conclusion was that palliative care was underutilized or delayed in COPD patients, which for those of us that have been in respiratory therapy for a long time does not come as a surprise. Palliative care is not just for those with cancer or COPD. It's also for children. This was research done at the University of Utah Hospital. It was a retrospective chart review. They evaluated over 24,000 charts between, the year, between 2001 and 2011. What they found was that only 4% of these children were coded for palliative care. Interestingly enough, over the study years, this increased to 8% because I think they knew people were watching. Of the children coded for palliative care, they had fewer hospital days, fewer died in the intensive care, and the overall cost was 26% less. Now, this next slide is a continuation of that other one. They found that palliative care services were more common in children with congenital or genetic disorders. They were more common in children with neuromuscular disorders and with cancer diagnosis. They did find that when palliative care services were enlisted, there was 73% less ECMO used. Analgesics, the need was 47% less, and sedatives was 78% less. Their conclusion was palliative services have increased but remain low in neonates and those with circulatory disease. And I also think that for those of us who have taken care of patients with cystic fibrosis, they may not be included in this, but we all know that our patients with cystic fibrosis need palliative care. This was kind of an interesting instrument that I found online, and it's an instrument developed to identify children with palliative care needs. It's a scale with five domains. There's a zero to four score for each, and the domains are expected life expectancy, expected outcome of current therapy, performance status, symptom problem burden, and the patient family health care provider preference. For example, expected life expectancy, zero to four score for each. If the expected life expectancy was another year, then the score would probably be zero on that one. If the expected outcome of current therapy was um, not good, then the score would be higher on that one. When they looked at all five of these domains, they added up the scores. If the score was 10 to 14, what they did is they introduced the pediatric palliative care concept. If the score was 15 to 24, they approached the palliative care team. And if the score for this particular child was between 24 and 40, then pediatric palliative care became the focus of care. I would dearly love to see somebody do something like this for our patients with COPD. We have a hard time getting them in palliative care. We even have a hard time getting them in hospice. This is another issue, a lot of misunderstanding of what palliative care is. Is it health policy? Is it place of death? Is it quality of life? Is it treatments? There's a lot of misunderstanding about palliative care. Doing research for an article I wrote, I was reading a lot of different 
authors, and I found that even just the term was not consistent. Some authors used palliative care, others talked about a palliative approach. Some called it specialized palliative care, others used it supportive care, and others just called it comfort care throughout the entire article. This is a simple study by, done actually by a fourth year medical student. What she did is she called patients with advanced cancer and she visited with them over the phone about services they might need in the future. So they all had advanced cancer. They were all looking at palliative care hospice down the road. She used the 10-point Likert scale to kind of score their responses. She used the script and she gave the same explanation for all of them with the exception that some heard the term palliative care and some heard the term supportive care. What she found was in the supportive care group, overall understanding of service was better, the overall favorable impression was better, and the future need for services for themselves or their family was better just by hearing a different word. Now uh, this one was a small study, and this was one that was actually done on palliative care understanding of COPD people. It wasn't clearly stated how many were in the study, somewhere between 31 and 32. Sixty percent of them were, were male. The mean age was 70, but the range was 43 to 87 years. What they found was 33 percent of these fellows were on home oxygen, or women too. 43% 43 per, 43 understood, understood the term non-invasive ventilation, but only 13% knew that palliative care was an option. 35% understood, understood the term CPR, but only 16% had ever had a resuscitation discussion. I think this really brings out the fact that we really need to spend a little more time talking about issues with our patients with COPD. The timing of palliative care. Start early, stay late, I think, is a good mantra for the timing of palliative care. Recent research which I've just cited indicates that starting palliative care early improves quality of life, it prolongs life, and it reduces cost. However, another thing that I've found when I'm doing research on this is that most articles using the search term palliative care are in conjunction with hospice. Symptom control needs to be not just when the patient is in hospice, but it needs to be before this. There is cost savings associated with palliative care teams. And when you're talking about hospice teams, it is usually just the doctor, the nurse, the chaplain, um, and the social worker. But palliative care teams are including therapists. It's a doctor. It's a nurse. It's the, the pharmacologist. It's the OT, the RT, the PT, the social worker. That includes a lot more people. And the overall cost savings from palliative care is substantial over $3,400 per patient. But there are barriers to palliative care. There's barriers to the timing of palliative care. And a lot of these include factors from all of us, the patient, the physician, and the therapist. Patients may not be willing to discuss what they perceive as death. If they understood palliative care to just be symptom control, I think they'd be willing to talk to us. But when they think palliative care is hospice, they may not want to talk about it. There are communication barriers between the patients and their family members. And if they don't understand the term, they're not going to want it. Position factors were going with uncertainty about prognosis. Again, um, 
if they have to document that somebody, that they wouldn't be surprised if somebody had less than six months left, if they're equating that with palliative care, then they, again, may not want to talk about it. But they have also cited scarce resources and time constraints. They are very, very busy, and they may not have time to do this. And again, poor understanding of palliative care. This is where I think we can be really helpful. We can help them understand the difference in what palliative care is all about. We're just trying to treat the symptoms. As far as therapist factors, there is poor understanding of palliative care. And if we don't see a palliative care order in the chart, I think there's fear of reprisal by physicians or supervisors if we go out on our own. But we may not always see that palliative care order. We may have to be doing things that are helping our patients become a little more comfortable. A new paradigm. This was kind of a new term for me. Back 20 years ago when I was teaching at a community college and our president had gone to a new conference and he came back all excited about paradigms and he called a faculty development in service. We all had to go and we had sat and listened for an hour about paradigms until we finally realized that all a paradigm was was a new way of looking at something. So I thought if we translate that to palliative care, Thinking of PC as patient comfort, or maybe think of PC as patient communication, or maybe think of PC as patient consideration. When we are asking them about their symptoms and we are trying to do something to alleviate their symptoms, we are comforting them, we are communicating with them, and we are taking them under consideration. Distressing symptoms is basically what we're treating. When the saturation is low, we give oxygen. When the patient is cold, we provide a blanket. When the patient has bothersome symptoms, what do we do? Treating these bothersome symptoms in a patient who is uncomfortable is palliative. Waiting until they are actively dying is unkind. Well, the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you a couple of assessments associated with palliative care. Uh, a pain scale is very useful. We can use verbal or facial grimaces. And I was putting this PowerPoint together. I saw this Lego pain assessment tool online. I don't know if any of you have seen it or used it. But what immediately came to my mind is if somebody showed me this, I would probably start laughing. Um, even if I was in pain, I think my pain would be relieved a little bit just simply looking at the silly faces on the Lego people. It's something you can use. The symptom assessment scale, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, is also one that can be used. I will tell you that one's quite a bit longer, and it probably covers a few more symptoms than we're really interested in with our COPD patients. The other one, and this is a new one, and this is a COPD assessment test, the CAT test. I couldn't download this. Initially, it was just available in England, and there's a couple websites that you go to that tell you it's not available in the United States yet. But that is old information. It is available, and it is available from the COPD Foundation. It's basically eight questions, and it assesses the severity of cough, chest tightness, breathlessness, sleep, mucus production, activities of daily living, and energy level. If you're interested in getting this, contact Scott Serretta at the COPD Foundation. And I don't have his information here, but if you just go to the COPD Foundation, you will find Scott's name because he's head of the education for the COPD Foundation. Another thing we need to assess is dyspnea. We've all used the Borg scale. Many of our patients that have gone through pulmonary rehab are very comfortable with this and can tell you without looking at a scale where their level of dyspnea is. Another one that I found is the Dalhousie dyspnea scale. And again, when I looked at this one, it made me laugh also. I know it was designed for children, but if you have this and you show this to somebody and see how bad their dyspnea is, they might get a laugh out of them too. 
Another thing that can be done, and this is a quick assessment, is rapid testing of the BNP. If you're not really sure whether this is a cardiac related shortness of breath, dyspnea, or pulmonary dyspnea, the rapid testing of the BNP can also tell, tell you if the patient has congestive difficulties or congestive failure. The geriatric depression scale is probably not one that you think about very often. You can download this from, from the internet. It is a short form. It only has 15 questions. I always have my students take this, not because I think they're depressed, but because I want them to see how easy it is to do this little short quiz. You can ask the questions. You can fill it out. You can give the questions to them. They can fill it out. And it's very easy to score. Our COPD patients, to a high percent, have depression. If this is something that's not treated and it can help them feel better, then this is something we really need to be looking at. As far as a spiritual needs assessment, this is probably not something we think of doing. However, it may be something that you want to ask the patients if they would like to talk to a spiritual advisor. And if that's the case, I would certainly talk to the social worker and make them aware and let them follow up on that. Palliative care in the ICU. This one um, was actually written by a doctor. It was published in November 2014. And they very clearly state that palliative care is interdisciplinary. They don't want to eliminate anybody from palliative care in the ICU. They strongly feel that palliative care is based on need, not on prognosis. And they are currently training ICU physicians to deliver palliative care. This is an ongoing, not, no much, not so much as a study. They've already studied it. This is basically an ongoing initiative right now. They are training ICU physicians in communication skills, and they are training them in ethics conflict resolution. Um, I'm going to say the outcomes data a little bit. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to skip down to number five. There are two position statements addressing the management of dyspnea. One is published by the ATS in CHEST, and the other one is the ACCP, published in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society. Um, I would strongly recommend, again, just downloading these position statements and have a copy in the department so we're all on the same page about how we're going to manage dyspnea. And speaking of morphine, which we have not yet, but we probably briefly need to do this, research indicates that regular low doses of sustained release morphine has been shown to safely reduce breathlessness without evidence of respiratory depression or the patient becoming obtunded. And I think this is a very powerful statement. Regular low dose sustained release morphine safely reduces breathlessness. This is a recommended initial titration, 10 milligrams over 24 hours and titrated by 10 milligrams if there is no benefit once they're in the steady state. A couple other studies, these are fairly recent ones also with some information on morphine. The first one, the use of morphine for symptomatic relief of dyspnea does not significantly change the level of oxygen saturation in the blood, does not cause high CO2 levels in the blood, and does not significantly compromise respiratory function. That is contradictory to some of the information we have received before, but this was a good study. The second one looked at benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines have been used for the relief of breathlessness for a long time. However, a meta-analysis of seven studies did not show a beneficial effect of benzodiazepines in treating dyspnea in patients with advanced cancer or COPD. So if you've got patients with cancer or COPD that are being given benzodiazepines for dyspnea, Talk to the doctor, show them the research, see if you can get them to go back with morphine. And we need to talk about nebulized morphine and fentanyl because I'm guessing of 
again, those listening, probably 80 or 90 percent of us have done this. Unfortunately, we don't have really good research on this yet. A systematic literature review of 39 publications, 17 of which were high quality clinical research, evidence was mixed for nebulized morphine. However, a potential benefit was suggested for nebulized fentanyl, nebulized Lasix, or nebulized Dilaudid. The second one was a systematic literature review performed on the use of fentanyl for refractory breathlessness. And these test results are promising, however, the efficacy trials are lacking. For those of you that are actually nebulizing morphine or fentanyl right now, keep track of how this works with your patients. If you're doing it, your doctors have approved this. Is this working? Is this helping? We need more evidence. We need more feedback on this. And so again, if you're doing it, let somebody else know what you're doing if it's working. I think sometimes the reason we are asked to nebulize morphine is we think that there is no better way that our patient can't swallow pills and we don't want to start an IV in them. So I added this slide just to show you some of the other routes of administration. Obviously, oral administration simpler is better. If they can swallow a pill, that's the best thing to do. Transdermal, the transdermal patch with morphine in, however, is useful in patients who are reluctant to take medication. Rectal administration, interestingly enough, is commonly used but not well studied. Neither is sublingual. We use it, but it's not well studied. The subcutaneous is an excellent alternative to those who can't take oral medications and in whom IV is not desirable or whom IV access is very difficult. Intramuscular morphine is not recommended and IV, which you know, is a standard route in the hospital setting. But we know, we know that morphine can provide relief for dyspnea at any stage in the illness. So don't hesitate to give the morphine because we're not going to do all those horrible things to our patients that we thought we were going to do. We're not going to put them in respiratory depression and they're going to die depending on the amount we give them. And again, you have to watch the dosage. Now, palliative care outcomes data. Let's go back to this one for a second. I, I alluded to it in one of the earlier slides. And this is something I would like you to consider doing, or at least consider thinking about doing. And if one month trial is too long, I would challenge you to consider trying this for one week. Ask every patient every day, are you in pain today? If the answer is yes, ask them if they told their nurse. If the answer is no, great. Ask every patient every day, are you short of breath at all today? If the answer is yes, are you short of breath at rest or when you get up? If they're not short of breath, that's good. Document at the end of every shift how many you had who answered yes or no to this. Now, I have also of the firm belief that every department has a therapist who wants to do a little research, who wants to put a poster together so they can go to the AARC meeting in Tampa next year. And that person who is doing the research can come up with a plan for you. At the end of the month or at the end of the week, evaluate the data. How many patients responded positively to these two questions? How difficult was this task? And was this task valuable to the patient? Was it valuable to the therapist? Was it valuable to the department? Was it valuable to the physicians? I know you're all doing outcomes data on a lot of different things. But maybe this is something when we're thinking about palliative care we need to start looking at. And if you've ever been a patient, you will understand just how kind it is to ask. So some interventions. If the patient is in pain, contact the nurse. Pain, medica pain medications may already be ordered, but the nurse might have gotten called off the floor to go someplace else. And maybe there's another nurse that can go in and give the patient their pain medicine. 
If the patient has dyspnea, try to assess how severe on a scale of 1 to 10. How bad is your shortness of breath? And then you can kind of say, you know, what worked in the past when you were short of breath like this? Does the nebulizer treatment help? Do you have an order for PRN albuterol? If it's going to help them, consider doing that. Does sitting up in bed help? Many times sitting our patients up in bed, propping them up with pillows, is going to make them more comfortable and a little less short of breath. And the next question is the patient on oxygen. If they're on low flow at one liter a minute or two liters a minute, consider switching to an air entrainment mask. I don't believe we need a doctor's order because we're not changing the FiO2 or the liter flow he ordered. If you give them 24% consistent with one liter or 28% consistent with two liters on an air entrainment mask, that added flow is going to provide cool air facial stimulation and that right there by itself may relieve dyspnea. If they're not on oxygen, now this one might be a little trickier to pull off because people might think they were on oxygen, but if you hook up an air entrainment mask to 21% and put it on a low FiO2, they're going to get a lot of air being blown in their face, which can relieve the sensation of dyspnea. If the problem is congestive heart failure, you need to talk to the physician. Interventions, pain is easier to assess just by looking at the patient. But dyspnea is very subjective. It is what the patient says it is, and it is a bothersome symptom. Palliative care is not just care at the end of life. It is not just care in patients with a terminal disease, and it is not just giving opioids. It is comfort care afforded to every patient with every diagnosis. I just ran across an article a few days ago, and I just want to read this to you. This was an article that was published last month, January of 2015, entitled Training the Next Generation of Doctors in Palliative Care. The abstract states there is a common misconception that palliative care is just another term for hospice care. Although it includes hospice, palliative care is also the long-term coordinated care of the chronically ill, which is delivered at cost savings. Why does this matter, that the average American understands what palliative care means? Because the evidence shows that U.S. patients near the end of life are spending exorbitant amounts of money on health care they do not want and the country cannot afford. Understanding palliative care is an important issue in the current debate about health care reform. I read that to you because I think it's important that you know that we're not in this alone. We all want palliative care. We all want everybody to understand that palliative care and hospice are two different things. The reality is in many hospitals, palliative care is only ordered when there is no hope of survival left and the patient is declared a DNR. The times that I saw palliative care written on a chart was when the doctor had said, patient DNR, start PC, palliative care. But you could be proactive. Being proactive is going to help you and your patient. You don't have to wait for an order to use common sense. We can provide patient comfort, and that is what we excel at. And now that I've talked for 43 minutes and started way late, if any of you are still there, I would be happy to answer Thank any Thank you, questions. Helen. And uh, we have quite a few people still here, so I'm very happy that you all hung with us till the end. This was a fabulous, fabulous uh, presentation. Um, before I get too far into the questions, one of the more recent questions that popped up in the chat area was whether or not morphine um, was covered under um, scope of practice uh, under state licensure. So I took the liberty of calling Cheryl West uh, for a couple of minutes here in our office. And for those of you who don't know Cheryl, she is our government affairs uh, director. Um, here at the AARC, and she knows everything related to licensure. And uh, she confirmed that for the most part, um, most, license, most scopes of practice identify um, that respiratory therapists can deliver a respiratory-related drug um, as long as you have the physician order and you follow the controlled substance procedures and, and so forth. Um, but ultimately, if you have a question in your state, you should always check with your state licensing board 
to ensure that that is um, how they interpret the scope of practice. So definitely check in with your state board. So Helen, uh, to kick off our questions, a lot of our participants had a pretty robust conversation about the use of oxygen at, at uh, during palliative care, during hospice, checking pulse oximetry, um, and and what kind of um, is it cruel to withhold oxygen? Is it prolonging death or prolonging the uh, the pain and suffering of the patient to use oxygen? Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the use of oxygen in this time frame? Interestingly enough, a lot of studies have shown that there really is no benefit for oxygen over room air, or over 21%. Um, this is the concept of putting oxygen on everybody just because we can put oxygen on them really doesn't, it's not supported by evidence. I think a lot of us put the oxygen on because we think it's going to make them breathe a little bit easier. I don't know that it does. As long as, as if they're just in palliative care, I've got no problems with them having the monitoring equipment in the room with them because we're just treating symptoms at that point. If they are a DNR, you shouldn't have any monitoring equipment in the room with them. And then uh, with, with, with hospice patients, if they are a DNR, we'll do whatever we need to do to make them comfortable. And if that's albuterol, fine. If that's oxygen, fine. Um, I, once they're a DNR, they really shouldn't have any monitoring equipment in the room with them because it's only going to stress the family out. If the monitor goes off, they want you to do something. Oh, at that point, we just need to keep the patient comfortable in the hospital. But with just palliative care, if we're just treating symptoms with a patient with COPD and they need oxygen, absolutely. Um, but I do really like the idea of switching them to the air entrainment mask because they have their own little personal fan on their face. And that does kind of reduce the sensation of dyspnea. We used to have families bring in their fans from home, but most hospitals don't allow that now because of the electronic situation. Thank you very much, Helen. I think that that was um, one, of the bigger, uh, one of the bigger issues. Um, is there any kind of... Um, evidence to state that, you know, as far as pain control goes, that there's any one type of delivery route for pain control that has worked better than others at uh, during this time frame, or is that a, an individual type of decision? I think that's an, in, I think that's an individual decision, but um, morphine basically covers both pain and shortness of breath. And I think morphine is probably the one that is used most often for pain. Um, I am not in favor of the benzodiazepines at all. The benzodiazepines, particularly in older adults, can cause a lot of problems with delirium and dementia. Um, depending on the age of the patient, older people don't really process those drugs. They don't metabolize them, and they can stay in the system for a long time, and they can become very dangerous at that point. Um, Morphine probably is one of the best drugs we have um, for both shortness of breath and pain. Um, and again, with palliative care, regardless of whether they have been declared as a DNR or a hospice, if they're in pain, we need to do something I think about it. One of the um, one of the more poignant statements that you had uh, during this presentation was at the very end when you were discussing. Um, the differences between palliation and hospice. Palliation and the application of palliation, of course, very misunderstood um, that, you know, it, it's not the equivalent of hospice. Um, so, you know, I think that perhaps one of the bigger um, messages to get out is, is that palliation can occur early in a patient's uh, disease process. So for example, uh, Helen, let's say that we have a patient who has a, a stage 3 COPD. And uh, this stage 3 COPD patient comes into our facility, 
short of breath, the typical COPD, typical COPD presentation, um, could you give us an example of how palliation might help a patient with that um, chronic disease who has not quite reached end stage? Um, first of all, ask the questions. If we don't know what their symptoms are unless we ask. How short of breath are you? Are you in any pain? Um, other, other, what are some other things that are bothering you? Even at that point, depression may be an issue. Um, anxiety, uh, things that are going on at home may be an issue. I think just looking globally at our stage 3 COPD patient and not putting them in a box and saying, um, okay, because you have stage 3, we're going to do this, that, or the other thing. I think you need to globally look at the person itself and say, what's going on? What is bothering you? What can we do to help? Obviously, if there's extreme shortness of breath, some low dose sustained release morphine to kind of calm that down. That can take care of the pain too. Um, just what, whatever is bothering them and that's what you really need to ask is what can we do to alleviate some of the things that you're dealing with right now. Um, getting him out of the emergency room, if that's where he came through, getting him into a bed, having somebody come in and talk to him, making sure he's got enough blankets. I know it sounds silly, but those are all the things that are going to calm him down. And once they get calmed down and they have less anxiety, I mean, stage 3 COPD going to the hospital has got to be thinking, I wonder if I'm going to go home again and you really need to calm them down. Helen, thank you so very, very much for providing this webcast. Thanks to everyone for hanging around with us until the very end. And, you know, this is, I think, Helen, an ongoing conversation. I think this was a great start to a really good conversation about palliative care in the respiratory therapist role. So I would challenge everyone who's with us uh, and who has, is listening to this live and as an archive to um, continue that conversation and join the free AARC Palliative Care Roundtable over on AARC Connect and continue this conversation about these, uh, about the, the questions and the debates and, and practices and licensure and scope of practice. I think that it could be a, a phenomenal discussion that so many of us uh, could receive a great deal of benefit. I agree. I agree. And you know, if any of you are willing to go and ask the patients the questions, are you short of breath or do you have pain today, share that with us. And if you're nebulizing fentanyl, I've had a couple people, you know, respond to me. Let's share. Let's share what's going on and what works and what doesn't work. Great. We're Thank all you so together. much, Helen, for joining us today. And thank for you for your you patience, watching, this everybody. is a live presentation. Please stay with us during the next brief pause for instructions on how to obtain your CRCE contact hour. If you are watching this program as an archive, this concludes our presentation.